used to having the praise team here on a regular basis. And I'll have everything start up. <coughs> Remember, we're coming together today to worship God. We worship the God who created the world. The God who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth for our salvation. Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. But that wasn't the end. He went to heaven. He sits there right now at the right hand of God, a position of power. And then he sent the power of the Holy Spirit to us. And so as you came into this worship service today, you came in here with all kinds of different feelings and thoughts. None of us really have the same position, but we're all coming together for the common purpose of bringing and having a communication with God. That's a wonderful experience for us. Is, is the mic on or is it off? Is it on? It's not on? I'm trying to get it on. Okay, I'll yeah. keep working at it. I'll look over here. Somehow that per didn't particularly work. So we're all coming together with a common purpose, to worship God. And God is going to work through us in this worship service. And so how we leave the worship service is all dependent upon you and God working together in a wonderful way. I just got a couple of announcements that I want to make, or one announcement um, that is important. There's the Help and Hope for Aging on September the 18th. It's gonna be held at the library. Last year it was here at the church and it was just a wonderful event. Some of our members are a part of that. Uh, if you want to reply, uh, email Jana uh, Kronstedt. Um, it's for people who are elderly or children who have elderly parents or people that you know that are elderly and want some uh, particular help in the Hope and Aging platform. If you would take out your uh, bulletin this morning, we're going to do the God is good part. The last two services, that was a great response. We'll see what happens here. I expect a really good one, too. Ready? God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Oh, Father, you are truly good all of the time. You are a great, wonderful, and gracious God. We give you thanks for your greatness. And we come together today to worship and praise you in a variety of ways. And may you speak to us. And Lord God, sometimes we need comfort. Sometimes we need to be able to see that there are things that you would like us to change. Sometimes, Lord God, we come to you and you say, this is where I want to lead you. And so, Lord God, we come with open hearts, open minds, to be in a communication directly with you through music, through scripture, through message, through each other, and above all, through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
In the name of God, the Father, our Creator. In the name of God, the Son, our Savior. In the name of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor. The commandments reveal our sinfulness, our need for a Savior and a way of life that is pleasing to God. You shall not have other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or a maidservant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophet hang on these two commandments. Those certainly give us an outline of reflecting on our life. But we also look at thought, word, and deed. We'll pray this prayer together. Father, we, your children, are so sorry that we do not always obey you. We are sorry that too often we try to be God and tell you what to do and how to do it. Father, we are so sorry that we do not always love others the way your son Jesus taught us to love. We bow before you in humility and cry out, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our intro psalm from Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, I need to know that you are watching me. You are the source of my confidence and security. Lead me to spend all my time pursuing your love and protection. I want to grow in my love for you and others. Amen. Good morning. First lesson is from 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. King David shows love to one of Jonathan's sons. David asked, is there anything still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. Then Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. 
Don't be, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will show you, surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will, will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at the ta David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame on both feet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. God's love and ours. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent us his Son in an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel comes to us from the gospel according to St. John chapter 13 and chapter 15. They're all on Jesus' command to love others. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. One of the ways that we love God and love each other is by sharing the, our, what we believe. And the creedal statement is a great statement of what we believe. And so today we're going to share with each other the statement of faith to support one another. Let us say it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge us, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. Children, you want to come up for the children's message? Do you like to get things for free? Yeah, most people do, right? Free is always a good price. Well, when we were on our trip this summer to the youth gathering, we saw some people that had t-shirts that said free, and then they had something on there they were giving away. Do you think that, do you, can you guess what they were giving away? No, free hugs. That's what they were giving away, free hugs. And some kids were keeping track. They were having people write their name on the back after they gave them a hug and things like that. They were giving away free hugs. Now, do you like hugs? Yeah. When, when do you like to get a hug? Why would you get a hug? Did you ever get, have you ever hurt yourself, fallen down or something like that? And, got a band-aid and then got a hug? Yeah, that's a good thing, we get hurt. Or maybe something else has upset you and you're crying or something like that and somebody gave you a hug. But sometimes, maybe you're really happy. So have you seen the Olympics? Have you seen people hugging each other after they go off through the gold, they get the gold medal? Yeah, so sometimes people hug when they're happy, sometimes when they're sad. But hugs show that you care about somebody. Hugs show some love. They're a way we can show that we love somebody and care about them without even saying a word. And they're free. Isn't that great? And you can give them away and you're not going to be any less. It's not like money in your pocket and then there's none left. You can keep giving them over and over and over again. And some time ago, someone came up with the statement that Jesus gave hugs. Now when you give a hug, can you give a hug standing like this? Yes. No. You can't really give a hug standing like this. Can you give a hug going like this? Well, if, the, if they're in between your arms already, yes. But otherwise, you have to put your arms out to get a hug, right? Yeah, you have to put your arms out. And that's what they said that Jesus did that when he went to the cross to take away our sins, he put out his arms and he died, and that that was a hug for all of us. That's pretty cool. So, do you think that you could give away some hugs today? No. Well, maybe just try, just one. Or maybe someone will give you one. How about that? So, so I think that giving away hugs would be a good thing to do today. So we have a sheet here that talks about loving one another and other things, you can think of other things you might do, but try giving away a hug today. Okay, can you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus who showed us the greatest love by dying for us on the cross. Help us to love others by putting our words into action. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
As Martha was talking today, I remember there was a song that the kids uh, sing. There's a special singer that comes to schools, and he does a great job in singing. And the song that he sang was Eight Hugs a Day. And I don't know the words, and I'm not going to sing it to you, but uh, it's a wonderful uh, song. Eight Hugs a Day. We all need eight hugs a day. So maybe before we leave the service, you can all have eight hugs today. We'll talk about that a little bit later because we want them to be good hugs. Today I'm going to start out with one point and then go to another one and another one and maybe 15 or 20 more after that. But the first point I want to start out with is what's your identity? Your identity is very important as you consider who you are. And as somebody, when they left the service this morning, they said, one of the problems that we have in society today is that people have lost their sense of identity. Well, that was a pretty powerful statement. So I want to ask you, what is your identity? And when I say that, some people will say, well, I'm a smart person. I'm a person who likes sports. My identity is a fun-loving person. I'm an angry person. I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a liberal, I'm a mill worker, I'm a janitor, I'm a business person, I'm a farmer, I'm a grieving person, I'm a widow, I'm a widower, I'm an addict, I'm a depressed person, I'm a mom, a dad, a child, an atheist. All of those are words that some people use, and I've heard them, as they begin to identify who they are. And as they identify who they are with those kinds of phrases, they think and act like that. And so we ask the question, who am I? If you look in the Bible, you will see that one of the things as your identity could be, I am a sheep. Because in the Psalm 23 and other parts of the Old Testament, we see that we as people, as God's people, are referred to as sheep. God is the shepherd. In the New Testament, we also are referred to as sheep, where Jesus talks about being the good shepherd and he knows the sheep. For some people to identify themselves as sheep is one way that they, can identify, they have their identification. If that's your case, there's no problem with that at all. We look at what the Apostle Paul says, or what Jesus said, or what the disciples said, sorry. What the disciples said, the disciples said they were disciples. The Apostle Paul said he is an apostle. Paul identifies himself as Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul identifies himself as a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul speaks and says he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Sometimes when I ask people, what is your identity, especially sometimes in the, in the church setting, and they very proudly say, I am a sinner. Now I want you to think about that, and I don't want to be offensive, but I just want you to think about that for a moment. For me, personally, there was a time in which I was a sinner. I was a poor, miserable sinner at one time. That was before I knew Jesus Christ. After I got to know Jesus Christ, my identity changed. I changed from a poor, miserable sinner to a different image. The Apostle Paul says in uh, Ephesians that he's writing to the saints in Ephesus. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, To all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. Notice there that he is talking to people as saints. Maybe that's what you want as an identity. Some people have trouble with that. Paul uh, also says in the book of Romans, or in Ephesians, I'm sorry, as well as Romans, that God, that our identity is one of a child of God. And that's one that I choose to use for myself, and I want to choose to have us think about that. Our identity is that I am a, God, a child of God. How did I become God's child? First of all, I was a poor, miserable sinner. But God did not want me to stay there. He wanted to change me from there to be one of his children. And we have... Uh, he, he did this by adoption. And in our congregation, we have people who adopt children. 
And in our community, we have people who adopt children. That costs money. And so we as a congregation help others to adopt children because we think it's a really wonderful thing. And so we give money to help people to adopt children. And so the question is, how much money did God pay Satan to adopt us? Well, he didn't pay us any money. He didn't pay any money, but he paid a tremendous price. The price was his son coming to this earth to live, to die, a miserable death on the cross. That was the penalty. That was the ransom that was paid in order to have us to be his children. And because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension, we are then adopted by God as his dear children. And now as the children of God and as God's children, I have a number of brothers and sisters throughout the entire world. Just think about all the people in the world who call themselves Christians and follow Jesus Christ. They are all my brothers and sisters. And then we can narrow that down to I am a Lutheran. We narrow that down a little bit to, I'm a Missouri Synod Lutheran. We can narrow that down just a little bit. I am a child of God choosing to worship at St. Luke's Church. And now I'm just going to leave here for a while, and I'm going to go over here and talk about that a little bit. My identity is that I am God's child. My identity is that I am choosing to worship at St. Luke's. And along with that identity comes certain things that we believe. Just my coming out here to talk to you like this is offensive to some people because I'm changing the identity of St. Luke's. And I had one person talk to me about this and said, Jim, you know, really that bothers me. And they're wonderful Christians. Because they, were, they came to church under a leadership of a person who really, really loved the Lord Jesus Christ. That he had a great passion for bringing people to Jesus Christ. He's just a great pastor. We heard a son talk about how his dad really, really loved the pulpit and proclaiming the word of God from the pulpit. And so that identity was something that many people took on. The altar being center very important. And so when I came out here, because some people say, another person said, Jim, when you came out here, that was just bringing the word of God to me and that was just so wonderful. But you see, it's difficult changing our identity because we are the family of God. We are the people of God. Oh, I just love the praise band today. I think, wow, wouldn't it be nice if they pray, played at every 1030 service? We could have that. Wow, wouldn't that be neat? Because I love the praise band. But then there are others that are going to say they're all part of the family of God. And say, no, my identity is that we have the organ play and we got three wonderful organists. And that's our identity as the people of God at St. Luke's. And so as you begin to look at the, our identity in our confirmation program, in all the other situations around. And you begin to make some changes to those things. You are, you, we are hurting each other, we are working together, but sometimes if we go too fast or go too slow, and we don't have a good communication and we do a lot of things in secret, it offends people because, hey, we're part of this, it's our identity. We are the people of God, and we love God greatly. But this is so much who we are. I remember at the Force as a little kid, when they, turned from, when they changed from German to English, my goodness, what a difficult time was that. When I was a little kid, they came into church, the men sat at one side, even though they were married, the women sat at the other side, and the kids always sat with the women. I don't know why, but that's where we were. And when they changed that, they even had to change it from two different doors. They changed it to one door. Oh, my goodness. And I remember also, we used the King James Version of the Bible. And then somebody came and said, we need to change to the uh, new King James or however that revised King James or something. Oh, my goodness. Changing our identity. Changing who we are. 
I know that with my own family situation, and I would bet that if you, some of you looked at your family traditions and how you're changing your identity and how difficult that is. I remember that we always went to grandma's place for some special meals. And then I got married. And her folks lived a long ways away. And it was her pattern to be with her family. And my pattern was with my family. And we couldn't get together for, for, uh, uh, and one, and that one day. So we were changing tradition. We were changing our identity as the people of God. All right, so I think I made the point. What's your identity? And as you change our, your identity, think about it. Look at this one more time. You take a person who is a non-Christian. And they are living the non-Christian lifestyle, thinking about it, living it. That is who they are. And then they meet Jesus Christ, and they become a child of God, adopted by God. And now they have a new identity. Can you imagine the changes that's going to take place in their life? And some of those changes take, come about slowly because they begin to grow. So I'm going to go to the second point, which is growth. In order to grow as Christians, we need to be in communication with God. Because God is the one that works with us to grow. I remember on the farm. There were certain things on the farm that God refused to do. He said, Jim, that's your responsibility. Some of them I wish he had done, like cleaning out the barn and all that stuff that comes with it. I wish God had done that, but he just gave it to me. Cleaning the chicken house, oh, that was a messy job. But God refused to do that. He said, that's your job, Jim. God said, your job is to go out and, and cult, uh, uh, plow. Oh, I love that one, God, because I love to drive the tractor as a kid and to cultivate and to plant the seed. Jim, that's your job. And I'm not going to do what I have assigned to you. But, Jim, my job is to provide the sun, the water, and all of that, which is other things that are necessary for that crop to grow, whether it was corn or wheat or potatoes or, or um, soybeans or cranberries or whatever it was. There are things that God will do and only God can do, and there are things that God says only you will do those things. Now, you apply that to our life, and I want to take a look at in our growth process. When I talk about growing as Christians, no longer being baby Christians, but being adult, mature Christians. And as we do that, some people will say, okay, what we need to do is always be in study the Bible. That's a good thing. Always have a lecture. That's a good thing. But is there any other way that we can grow as people of God? And so I'm going to ask you this question. As the people and the children of God, can you grow through suffering? Is that a vehicle in which God can use to help you to grow? A lot of you have come this morning suffering, or you know people who are suffering. There's a lot of suffering in our world, in our community, and within our church. A lot of suffering. People dying, people getting sick, People losing job, family conflict, divorce, turmoil within families, turmoil within organizations. Ah, oh, a lot of suffering going on. And one of the things that we say in Grief Share is that grief or suffering exposes our faith, but it also can expose our lack of faith. Sometimes as we're going through suffering, and I know this from my own experience, sometimes when I was going through suffering, it exposed the fact that what, what I would say was at one time, I wasn't putting into practice as I was going through that suffering. Because there are some times when I was going through the suffering, rather than relying upon God, which I really believed was the truth, I relied upon myself and said, okay, I'm going to solve the problem myself and it caused so many difficult problems. And so as you're going through suffering, don't suffer the way the world suffers. The world turns to addiction. The world turns to shopping. The world turns to alcohol. The world turns uh, 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 gambling. The world turns to bad relationships. 
Hugs are good. They are wonderful if they are given by Christians to Christians. But hugs, if you're looking for a hug in the midst of suffering and you're doing it the way the world does it, it's going to turn into a disaster. Because the world doesn't look at a hug as a wonderful thing. It looks at the world, the world looks like it, at it as manipulation, taking advantage of an individual. And so as you're going through suffering, ask the question, am I going to handle my suffering the way the world does? Or am I going to handle my suffering the way that Jesus Christ did? How did Jesus Christ handle the suffering? Remember, he went, had a lot of different times of suffering. Jesus Christ, when he was here, the Pharisees and them were very angry with him. And there are times that people get angry with us. And so what are we going to do? We're going to do like the world does? We're going to fight back? They hit us, we hit them harder? With words or with actions? No. We do what Jesus Christ did. He went to Father. Father, I need some help here. These people are hard to get along with, but I need some help. And he went off to pray. He He looked at the scriptures. Oh, that reminds me. Scriptures are very valuable. Wonderful. But sometimes I'm talking to people who are suffering who say to me, Jim, I haven't been in the Bible for a long time and I haven't the foggiest idea where to look. I know you want me to read the Bible more, but I don't know. And so I said, oh my goodness, what have I done? I haven't provided a place for younger Christians to begin to grow in understanding the Bible in the midst of their suffering. And so I said to a person, why don't you pray and, and, and talk with God about this? And they said, Jim, I don't pray. You know, you have those formal prayers and you, you pray and you, you sound so wonderful when you're praying, but I don't know how to do that. I said, oh my goodness, I haven't helped the young Christian to learn how to pray. I got, I got to find vehicles and ways to help them to learn to pray. You know, suffering as we come to God There's a lot that we can do to help each other. What did Jesus Christ do when he went through times of suffering? I'm thinking about the time that he was in the garden. And he knelt down and he prayed and he prayed earnestly. And he was saying, Father, I would rather not go through this. And then he closes it off with, but not my will be done, but thine be done. And what is the father's response? The father in the heavenly kingdom is looking down at his son and he says to an angel, my son's having a difficult time. Go down and minister to him. And when you and I are going through times of suffering and we turn to the father and say, father, I can't handle this anymore. I feel helpless and I feel hopeless. And God comes to us in a variety of ways to help us. He comes through the scripture, through prayer, through music, through worship, through people. Particularly people who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And people who have experienced the love of God before God comes through them. Oh, you know, we have a wonderful congregation. I was just with the uh, social concerns the other night and they talked about all the wonderful things that we're doing as a congregation through social concerns. The women's ministry, oh man, aren't they just fantastic? And we have a great president there, and my goodness, yesterday they worked so hard, and they worked so hard in so many different projects, and they love and care, and, and sometimes they're coming, those women are coming to me and they're saying, Jim, I went to visit this person, I went to visit that person, fantastic. And sometimes I call them up and say, would you go visit this person? They said, yeah, we'll go visit them. Wow. Veterans of the Cross, wow, fantastic ministry. The music ministry, beautiful ministry that we have going for us. Christian education, beautiful ministry that's going for us. And all the different people that work, the property care, beautiful ministries that are taking place as the family of God. Wow. So God, in his love, comes and ministers to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his word, through prayer, through people as you love and care for each other. I want to close with this.
Sometimes when we're going through suffering and we look at our sinfulness and sometimes we go to the land of guilt and shame. What a land that is. In the land of guilt and shame is, I was a bad person, I did something wrong, I'm terrible, I don't know why I don't do this. If I'd only done something differently, it wouldn't have turned out this way. If I'd only been there, it wouldn't have turned out this way. If I had only said this, it wouldn't have turned out that way. That's living in the land of guilt and shame, and some of that is okay. And we bring that to God, and we don't stay in that land, and we say, God, I messed up. And God says, I know you did. But I'm not going to leave you in that land. I'm going to give you salvation. And he takes us over the land of grace. So we can have grace for ourselves and grace for each other. And that's what we need is to understand this land of grace and to have every one of us live in the land of grace as we talk about our identity. It's so important as we talk together openly about our identity. Who are we as the people of God? We are the people of God filled with grace. 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 Then we have a connection. Shall we rise for prayer? Father, you are a wonderful God. And Father, we know that for some times you come to us and you give us a lot of peace and a lot of joy. But Father, I also know that there have been times that you've come to me and you stirred me up a little bit. You troubled me a little bit. Because you were revealing to me some of the things that I was doing wrong that were displeasing to you. And because of your great love, Father, you... You wanted to have me look at that, and you exposed to me my wrongdoing. But Father, you didn't leave me there. You took me and forgave me and took me into another land of grace and then helped me to grow. And that growth sometimes, Lord God, is, is difficult, but that's what we want to do. We always want to grow in our relationship with you to become more like Jesus Christ, not just to look like him, but to grow like, to be like Christ inwardly. We want a total transformation of our inside so that our inside can be just like Jesus. Make us more like Jesus. So our identity could be we are your children like Jesus is. Not just on the outside, but on the inside especially. Lord, we thank you that you keep helping us with our identity and who are we in Christ. And then help us to be in the land of grace in our families. Our families need so much grace. Lord, help us to make it through sometimes one day at a time. And then you help us with the next day and the next day. Father, we trust you as we pray our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
into the world in peace. Have courage, hold to what is good, return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's go. 